Whoa. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Having fun with those speakers so far? Yeah. It's a great show for the first one of 2024. Give a round of your uh, applause to yourselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thanks everybody for showing up tonight. Uh, very excited to introduce our last speaker here, um, Dr. O Amber Ortega. Um, she, uh, and, and I, I love like when somebody adds like a little bit of spice to their bio. So um, I'm gonna read it with the, the spice. Igniting stages with flair and science. Dr. Amber Ortega is no stranger to the heat of discovery. Uh, with a PhD in um, astrophysics and the oceanic science uh, sciences with specialization in analytical chemistry from CU Boulder and a postdoc in chemical engineering from Arizona. Uh, she's not uh, just fascinated by fire. She's researching them by flying through pyroconnective clouds uh, with unravel to unravel the smoky secrets of air quality, weather, and wildfire impacts, earning her the title Dr. Smoke. Uh, yeah. uh, when not in the lab or being a smoke chasing maverick, uh, Dr. Smoke crafts models uh, that forecast more than just weather. Uh, they predict air quality and help advise health advisories. Um, her publications, uh, Blaze Trails, Fanning the Flames of Knowledge, while keeping a sharp eye on the environmental horizon. She's a chemical engineer by training, a meteorologist by degree, a, an atmospheric chemist by calling, and a wildland firefighter. Um, yeah, fusing elements of humor and brilliance in reaction to nothing short of groundbreaking. Everybody, welcome up, Dr. Smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amber. Hey, everybody. Right. See how long my leash is here. Hey, everybody. Um, happy to be the last speaker. I'm going to close you guys out. Thanks for staying for the last band. You know how that goes. Um, and um, appreciate all the other speakers that have gone up here. And I'm going to give you lots of information all at one time, well, in a short 15 to 20 minute presentation. So before I start, I want to say thank you to my community, to my friends who have all showed up, to my friends that wanted to show up but didn't buy tickets till last minute and it sold out, uh, to my super supportive boyfriend who's the real nerd in our household. <laughs> um, and to essentially all the people who have hired me to do this, because I have my dream job, and no woman has ever had this job before. So basically, all of, all of the old white men who put their neck on the line to hire somebody like me, a millennial, which at the time when I started getting hired was like a really weird thing. So like, thanks guys for like trusting the process and like hiring somebody who didn't look like anybody else in the room at the time. And like, let's keep that going. Um, so this is what happens when you ask ChatGPT to describe what I do for a living. And to be honest with you, it's really not far from reality. It's, it's like a little bit more saturated and it kind of looks like they're in water, but also in a wildfire. So it's not scientifically accurate, but like it's pretty close. So how did I get into this? Uh, does anybody remember the Weather Channel from the 1990s? There's a band, The Weather Report. It's got like some smooth jazz. Well, um, I am from Pennsylvania. I'm from the East Coast near the Appalachian Trail. And my parents moved with me to Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I was about five years old at the time. And I had never experienced an actual tornado. So after, uh, you know, the severe weather, this is Dixie Alley here. Um, and, you know, hiding in the basement regularly for tornadoes. By the age of eight, I was a self-proclaimed meteorologist. I moved my bedroom to the basement, the only tornado-safe place in your house. I started deciphering Doppler radar, predicting storm development. <laughs> and, you guys remember these? <laughs> well, you know, when you're in elementary school, you start learning about fractions and percentages. And I was like, let me see here if I can figure this one out. How do you calculate relative humidity? I know when it's 100%, the dew point and the temperature are the same. 
Well, I found out later, many years later, as I was getting two degrees in meteorology, that's the clausius clapeyron equation. And I was not going to derive that as an eight-year-old, but I sure as hell tried. So, abrupt change. How many of you have been asked about smoke or wildfires or ask other people about them? How many of you have breathed in smoke from a wildfire? <laughs> As I said, this whole building has probably been fumigated a couple times. And who knows what AQI means? All right, all right, we got some people in here. So this is my, um, when I present this, I'm not going to tell you guys who I work for, because I'm not allowed to. Um, my opinions, these are all mine. They're not the federal government's. But when I do put this slide up, <laughs> when I put this slide up in the federal government rooms, this is like very shocking to them. And it's a little bit of that like offensive TED talk hook that gets you involved. But very few people will lose their homes to a wildfire. But all of us in this room have breathed in smoke. Everybody in the United States has breathed in smoke. So smoke knows no land management boundaries. It doesn't matter if it is Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, some local county, some dude burning trash in his backyard. The smoke unites all of us. And people sacred to this land used to think, or still think, people who lived here well before us thought smoke was sacred. Smoke was our prayers. Fire was here before we ever will were and fire is going to be here after we're gone so let's think about fire that way let's think about fire as something we expect to happen because it's part of the natural landscape and not something we're afraid of all right so how do you how does a fire scientist do research particularly on smoke before the modern era these are oil paintings from the 1830s when explorers came out to the Nebraska Territory, which was essentially the same place we are now, as far as they were concerned. And um, this is a painter that came out with them. And he painted wildfires. And he described them in his journal as the most terrifyingly beautiful thing he's ever seen. The one thing I want to point out in these photos is while these are, not photos, look at that. Jeez, it's so freaking. Mm. Uh, these paintings is the overwhelming percentage of what's in these images is smoke. So smoke is something that is how we communicate with fire. Most of you will never see flames coming at you, but you're going to breathe in the smoke. We don't even really care too much what's on fire out there until we see the big towering smoke plume, and then we really care, and we want to know what's going on. So this is my little slideshow moment of perspective. Who was around in 2020 during the Cameron Peak wildfire? This is all from the day it blew up in September 2021, or 2020. This is what a hotshot sees. This is when it's blowing up. He is uh, on a gravel there. That's a safe zone. There's, there's no fuel between him and the fire. But that's what it looks like when you're experiencing a blow up on a wildfire. This is what my boss texted me that day. So this is what my supervisor sees. Second story bedroom, Golden, Colorado, looking north. This is Greeley. This is what the sunset looked like in Greeley. That's a little uh, Lord of the Rings two towers, I think. <laughs> Fort Collins. That's out in the, uh, what do we call that? Western Kansas part of Colorado. <laughs> and that's what it looks like that's what the world sees. That's what a satellite sees. Not only the heat detects, but the plume coming off of it. So when you hear the worst air quality in the world or the worst mega fire ever, these are the kind of images that cause that kind of reaction. So really, even the way that that particular fire communicates to the entire planet is through its smoke. And if you know a thing or two, you can tell we're in Colorado, right? So the prevailing wind comes from this direction. Yeah, I'm an old school meteorologist. And all this smoke here, obviously, is not from this fire. You can tell where the wind's blowing, right? It's going brrr. So something happened to bring all this smoke this way. That's because that same wind event hit the western United States a few days prior. So this is Yosemite. This is from the tunnel view. I took these photos. This is four days apart. There's no fire in the park at all. There's nothing that has changed in these photos 
in terms of the fire activity besides the weather. So really the difference between a clean day and a dirty day, wherever you are, whatever type of air pollution, is because of the weather. That's why I got invested in air quality, smoke, and fire, was through being obsessed with weather. This is an example of some filter tape from one of our smoke monitors, and it pulls in a sample, deposits on a tape, and then uses a radiation source to measure the weight of it. This little sample moves every 24 hours. So this is an example of a cross-section of what's in your lungs on smoky days. And now I know that really concerns all of us, but I've been working in wildfires now for seven years, and this is the first year that I had long bronchitis. So imagine the first line responders that are there for months on end, for seasons on end, every single year. So wildfires are a growing public health threat. You know, I bet everybody in this room, if I surveyed you before this, you would say like, wildfires are getting worse in climate change and what are we gonna do about them? You're not wrong. It's increasing, the seasonality is happening. Uh, probably a lot of people in this room are either affected by or emotionally scarred by the Mar Marshall Fire just up the road. This is an example of a fire camp that I was stationed in that had already burned over. This is the China Peak Camp in California. So how did I get there, right? The whole thing that I started as a science che atmospheric chemist and then turned into a wildland firefighter. As I was getting my meteorology degree at Penn State, I watched a professor give a talk on flying airplanes into wildfires to measure the chemistry. And I showed up in his office the next day and said, hey, I was a little bold compared to what I am now. I said, hey, I don't wanna wait tables anymore. Like, could you pay me to do that shit? And he was like, yeah, I think I can get you a National Science Foundation grant. So I worked on um, Athos, which is a laser-induced fluorescence instrument. It's a cute little um, engine intake in the belly of a DC-8, and we would fly into pyroconvective clouds above Canadian forest fires. So the Canadian forest fires get a lot of press this summer. Turns out Canada burns about that much every single year. It just so happened it was an El Nino year, so the weather took it towards the East Coast and everybody cared a lot more than normal. Um, this is an example of one of the fires that we flew into during Arctis. This is the Rim Fire in California, and you can see how far the smoke was lofted from the source. So we would fly um, at like a thousand feet AGL into the fire front, and then we'd spiral up inside the fire, and then we'd track it long range to look at how does that smoke evolve over time. And uh, I am old enough that my research was in newspapers in Canada. Um, these are our flight tracks from that. So these are all of the flights we took during each season during that mission. So we were looking at how these boreal and Siberian forest fires can get high up in the atmosphere and then travel around the globe. We're also looking at all of the California wildfires that season. So I've been talking about smoke, I've been talking about fire, but what's PM 2.5, anybody? And what's a 2.5 mean? <laughs> All right, so this is a great image. Uh, we talked about COVID, COVID, there's a size of COVID. Um, bacteria, PM 2.5 is particulate matter smaller than one micron in diameter. There's a red blood cell and then there's PM 10, which is just below 10 microns in diameter. A micron is a thousand millimeters. So if we look at a human hair cross section, this is how many PM10s you can fit across it. This is a piece of sand, and this is PM2.5 within that PM10. So wildfire smoke, when we talk about smoke, it's everything that goes up in the smoke plume. It's the water vapor, it's the carbon dioxide, and everything else. The majority of things up in that plume are greenhouse gases. Believe it or not, water is a greenhouse gas. Look it up, it's the most prevalent in the world. Um, the other 10% are other trace gases. A lot of those are criteria pollutants. We're not going to get into that, but if you took my air pollution class when I taught at Metro State, you'll find out more about that. 70% um, of all particulate matter in these smoke plumes is PM2.5. That's particularly important because it can stay aloft. I remember being in Denver, probably at a happy hour on a patio during the Cameron Peak fire. And I remember full on like ash intact pine needles like falling on my skirt. Those fall out. The PM 2.5 can stay aloft for a really long time and travel around the globe. It also is small enough to get deep into your lungs. So your respiratory system can pretty much filter out soot and sand, 
dirt. But when it's that small, it gets all the way in your lungs and can go down into your bloodstream. So it's both a respiratory irritant and a cardiovascular irritant. And there's lots of health impacts. I was in Portland during this. This was one of those worst air quality in the world. And this is a uh, each day uh, photo from one of the tall buildings in Portland. I remember flying in when it was a, like this from Denver, because I usually get sent to where there's the worst air quality in the world from wildfires. And as we were descending below 10,000 feet, like the cabin filled up. It was terrifying. This was 2020, so I read it N95 masks on, which is the best you can do. But boy, if you ever hyperventilate due to fear of, you know, being in some action-packed, scary movie where the cabin fills up with smoke while wearing an N95, that's heroic. I'm not going to talk about all these numbers because you guys may or may not care. And if you do, take a picture of it and then find me on the internet because you can Google me and we'll talk about it later. But it's expensive, right? And smoke um, exposure is cumulative. So it took me seven years of wildland firefighting to get long bronchitis. And I'm not a hotshot. I'm not on a hand crew. I go out every season for about two months every year. Thank you, everybody who loves me and supports me through like how crazy that makes me. Um, but for all of us who breathe in a little bit of smoke each year, it's cumulative. And it costs a lot of money. There's charts out there by public health experts where they can show mortality and early hospital visits and premature death just from smoke and not being directly a first line responder. So how does it change over time? In the background, those of you who may have ever like Googled wildfire smoke may have come up with the model that's in the background. That is the high resolution rapid refresh smoke model. And that tracks particles over time. So we talked about all the types of pollution that come out of it, uh, a smoke plume, and that evolves over time, right? If you've ever taken chemistry, you know there's like surface chemistry, aqueous chemistry that happens in water, air chemistry. Um, all of that chemistry can happen in the atmosphere once it's emitted. And then of course you expose it to sunlight. So you start getting photolysis reactions, which are reactions due to the photons that come from the sun and smoke evolves over time. So this is an active area of research. Enter my dissertation, my PhD slide. Do you know how much I had to dig for this? This was like 10 years old. I had to go like pray that I saved it to a Google Drive when I backed up when I finished my PhD. Um, so I investigated secondary organic aerosol aging and from different emissions environments. And we'll get into that just a little bit. So. Fluent of smoke plumes, right? Measured how that evolves over time. And then we went to the fire science laboratory in Missoula, Montana. We burned a known quantity of stuff. And then I developed this pretty cool little oxidation flow reactor that had two lightsabers in it. It actually had two mercury lamps. If you've seen them, they're like this big. And they um, emit 185 and 254 nanometer light to simulate the photolysis effects of the sun. Um, and it's a little inlet. You can put it onto any mass spectrometer and measure what would happen in the atmosphere when you expose it to the sun. So this is the burn chamber at the Missoula Fire Lab. We're burning saw grass. And you can see my little glowy light up there, right? So that is the um, oxidation flow reactor. These are a bunch of aerosol inlets. There's a bunch of mass spectrometers in there and a whole room full of scientists over there. And just to prove that I do work with mass spectrometers, this is a mass charge ratio distribution of mass spectrometer. What we did was we looked at um, volatile organic carbon, which is gas phase, not particulate matter, right? Just like water can be in the gas uh, or the aerosol. Well, let's, let's back that up. Water can be a gas or a solid or a liquid, right? So can everything else. Not everything. There's not the triple point. That was in the first plot with the... Clausius Clapper on equation. But we took the um, gas phase mass spectrum before we threw it through the little light chamber and after, and then we just did a subtraction. So that the, some mass spectrum elements increased when we exposed it to light and some decreased, which means you can grow bigger particles when exposing to light, and you can also degrade certain kinds of particles and gases when exposing to light. Uh, I don't really want to go into this too much, but this is the combination of 
when we, uh, all the, this is from flying into smoke plumes. This is from aging smoke plumes in a lab. So artificially aging them like the way the atmosphere does. And the moral of the story is they have the same shape and trajectory. So they age similarly. When you put all this together, you then put it into that smoke model I showed. So a number of the equations that we developed during this research became the smoke models that we use today. This is one day, this is March 5th, 2021, and these are all the fires burning on that particular day. So fire is ubiquitous, it touches everywhere. Um, there are some places, certain times a year, where they are just on fire continuously. The American West used to be like that. So I was groomed to be a tenured professor, and I quit because I got into the realm of publish or perish. And this is no offense to anybody out here who makes a living doing this, but for me, academic research was masturbatory. I'm writing papers for other people who are only gonna read my papers, to write papers, to read papers, to get grants, to keep writing the papers. <laughs> and the broader impacts for everything I wrote was public health, firefighter safety, and climate change. And nobody was following what we did down to see if it was impacting the people who breathed in that air. So I quit my job, and I became a firefighter. There I am on the end. Thank you. This is a bunch of, um, this is an incident meteorologist and a bunch of remote weather station technicians and myself on a wildfire about 40 minutes before we had to evacuate because that area burned down. And here's some photos from my adventures thus far as a wildland firefighter. We put chemistry instruments out on the landscape. So this is that one with the tape I showed you with the cross sections. This is in Yosemite. Here I'm giving a New York Times reporter an interview at the edge of one of the most devastating wildfires in California. We are flying uh, in a helicopter, putting some suitcase bomb looking smoke instruments into the helicopter to measure the smoke real time to ground truth the smoke models. So you know that old uh, that saying in the cartoon, what the going out into the wild looks like to a scientist? Looks like this. So I happen to be helping mammoth lakes understand while some days were really smoky and some days really weren't. And again, we can get into that if you want, but this is the wildfire. This is the convective smoke plume, convection, stuff gets warm, it rises. This is the upslope diurnal winds. That's the sun. This is Minaret Vista, if any of you have been in Mammoth. These are the winds aloft, so the winds uh, are blowing this way because you have a very hot desert on that side. Um, and that's Mammoth Mountain. So why Mammoth was either hazardous air pollution or really good was because there was a fight right here between the upslope winds and the winds aloft to see what happened with that smoke. And I got called in to like do a Facebook Live TV briefing. And it was my first time as a fully qualified firefighter to do that. And Mammoth Lakes has a lot of money, so that's a lot of pressure. And I just Monday morning quarterbacked it. I took the photo. And I, live on air, was like, you know what? This is what's happening. They really appreciated it, and that's where I got the title, Dr. Smoke. So I don't want to go into this too, too much, but we need to create fire-resilient ecosystems. So your next question is, what are we going to do? There's wildfires everywhere. We all breathe in the smoke. There's no amounts of smoke that are healthy for us. Like, holy shit, right? Uh, I get a call probably once a year from good friends that are having climate guilt because of this kind of thing. So what do we do about it? Our forests are totally overgrown right now because we've pretty much excluded fire because we're afraid of it. Similar to our apex predators. When fire comes through, when it looks like this, it burns everything down. It looks like the Lorax and scorched earth. The best way to do something about that is adding fire back into the landscape. And I love this quote, the most important human influence on Western ecosystems in the last century is wildfire suppression. So what do we do? We work together as a community. We realize that smoke doesn't know where your neighborhood ends and somebody else's begins. They don't care where Boulder meets Jeffco or any of that kind of stuff. So this is a whole human problem. And maybe you rake the forest where you live, but that doesn't mean your neighbor does. 
So there, whose risk is it? Whose fault is it? And if the air knows no land management boundaries, who's in charge of the smoke? Uh, so this is my plug for prescribed fire. If you see fire out there or a sign that says controlled burn, like, yes, hell yes, because they're trying to create a fire break for you and your community. There are certain types of ecosystems that have to burn. There are certain types of pine cones that won't open and let out their spores unless they burn. So us putting out the fire every time is actually creating really, really old forests that are full of dead and down trees that are essentially matchbox, you know, matchsticks waiting to go up. If any of you have driven through Monarch Pass recently, it's freaking scary. There's like half of the trees are just standing dead. So if there is a lightning strike, that will be a raging crown fire. And the best way to do something about that is to put pot fire back on the landscape. This is an example from the bootleg fire where um, there was a thinning and prescribed fire project. And down here, they only did thinning. So thinning is where you collect all the dead and down, you stack it in a little campfire-like thing. You may have seen these out there hiking or in Rocky Mountain National Park, and then you burn those little piles. When you do thinning and prescribed fire, not only do you burn the piles, but after that, then you actually just light the landscape on fire on its own. When a wildfire interacts with that, you can see that just thinning alone and not doing fire on the landscape doesn't do much for this ecosystem. You really have to do both. And once you've done both, you prepare that land to receive more fire over time. So we know this plot. We, we looked at this guy earlier. This is all of the PM 2.5 from all the sources. This is wildfires. This is prescribed fires. And you can see all the other sources other than fire are going down over time. But wildfires are kind of keeping that constant. And the tale of two smokes. So this is the final Cameron Peak burn scar. This is uh, Horse Tooth Res over here, Fort Collins over here. The light blue are all the places where we did prescribed fire. And the dark blue is a previous wildfire. Can you tell me, our nerdy audience, what helps steer and slow down that fire? Woo, I wish I had prizes for everybody, but I don't. Um, yes, prescribed fire. The one place where we didn't have any fire is where it got to move the furthest east and into the city limits. The other thing I want to put out here is I know that when we hear about smoke from prescribed fire, we think Cameron Peak, Twin Towers, Doom, smoke clouds. But from these prescribed fires here, there were zero air quality advisories. From the Cameron Peak fire, there was a month straight. So we have to talk about consent and risk. Do you consent to seeing a little bit of smoke, breathing in a little bit of smoke for a few days to avoid the risk of months of smoke exposure? So air quality index, PM 2.5. This is the air quality index. I am not gonna go into numbers here. We're gonna talk about colors. So all of us fancy atmospheric scientists and public health officials developed a scale so that we can communicate with the public so you guys don't have to know what a microgram per meter cubed is. What this means is when it hits orange, sensitive people need to take mitigation. When it goes higher than that, everybody's impacted. This is some of the guides. You can look up AQI and get the guides on what you should do. But uh, above unhealthy, everybody's impacted. The other thing I want to mention is like, if any of you have gotten into hearing loss prevention, uh, you're at a rock concert, right? And you're, you can lose a little bit of hearing because it's really, really loud. But if the rest of your day is pretty quiet, not that much damage. Whereas if you're exposed to a medium amount of sound consistently, you can have hearing damage. Smoke is the same way. This was from a prescribed fire, and this is a hit of smoke that went through town. But the rest of the day was really good. Well, the rest of the day here was really good, and it averaged to a pretty good day overall. So when you look at a smoke map, oops, sorry. When you look at a smoke map, you might happen to get that instantaneous, but that's why PM 2.5 is done on a 24-hour average. Um, who can name sensitive groups to smoke? Sure. Boom. Nobody said pregnant women, come on. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And if there's one takeaway I want to give you guys is um, fire.airnow.gov. It has all of the fires on it. It has all of the EPAs, P 
PM2.5 monitors. It has all of the purple air low cost sensors on it. And these triangles are mobile smoke monitors that the Forest Service dispatches to wildfires in places where we don't have permanent monitors. It also puts on here all of the smoke plumes, which are based on the last satellite images. If you click on a monitor, you get this little pop-up that tells you what's happening. It tells you the trend. And if you have this box over where you are with an exclamation point, you can click that and you can get your smoke outlook. So people like me get dispatched to wildfires to make tailored smoke forecasts because you can't open your iPhone and find out what's the smoke going to do tomorrow. So we put out these tailored smoke forecasts. We say what the fire is doing. We embed directly with fire behavior analysts, with operations. We fly into the fires. We know what's burning. Because how do you really know what's coming at you if you don't know what's burning? That's the problem with the satellite-initiated smoke models. They don't know what's burning. They don't know if it's burned before. They could see a pixel on fire, and they could send out a huge smoke plume when maybe that was just a patch of grass, right? That maybe wasn't a, a timber stand. So these are the different things you can do when you're like, what do I do? There's the big expensive smoke monitors like we talked about here. But these are low cost sensors. These are both purple air. I, they should have stock in me, basically, at this point. Um, but this is indoor air monitoring. Um, some of my folks know that I have one of these in my house. And you know, you just cook bacon, and the thing goes red. And you're like, oh, no. Um, so this tells you your indoor air with the color of the air quality index, which is great. This tells you your outdoor air. So what, right? So if it's bad outside and it's kind of bad inside, what do you do? This is literally the most effective thing. If I can get all of you to stash a couple box fans and some HVAC filters, when it's smoky, when you burn the bacon, when your neighbor's chimney breaks, when your roommate's smoking a lot of pot, you put this together and it'll do great things for you. This gets you 90% of the way to an expensive HEPA filter. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather put one of these next to me at my desk and work than work indoors with an N95 mask on. And the last thing I will leave you with is that we have to make friends with fire or we will be consumed by it. The forces that be in our government agencies have come together to develop the wildfire crisis strategy. And this talks about how there's good fire and bad fire, prescribed fire, wildfire, but there's no such thing as good smoke. So we have to work together to help our community members that don't have access to this kind of information. If you have an elderly resident nearby, if you know your friend's mom has COPD and we're getting smoke coming through, take her a box fan air filter. We gotta take care of each other. That's all I got, thanks guys. Woo. I see you have a Stanley. No, uh, well, oh. actually, on the front is Woodsy Owl, which is a Forest Service Smokey the Bear type entity. Oh, hell yeah. Give a hoot, don't pollute. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, do we have questions for Amber? I'm looking out. Right here. Have you uh, resourced? of wildfires with the, uh, the bird overseas? I haven't, I have not. I don't know if they let us do that. <laughs> but I'm sure we can dig up some emission factors for that. I know that like tire smoke, for example, is very long lived and there's a lot of those reactive VOCs in it. Um, and like a VOC, can do the equivalent of you have um, your windshield wipers when they're really old, they get all like brittly. Essentially, that kind of smoke can do that to your lungs. Whoa. I know. Don't tell them I told you. <laughs> yeah. Wait, could you go a few slides back to the smoke map? I thought that this was cool. I noticed, wait, yeah, wait, go back to that or forward. I noticed that you wrote this. I did, I did. Yeah, there cool. is my contact information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I am part of what's called the Interagency Wildland Fire Air Quality Response Program, and we get dispatched all over to respond to air quality emergencies. Wow. Um, more questions? Right here. Where is the awesome artwork that was on your first slide from? Um, <laughs> I literally got that from like Googling like wildfire smoke paintings. But if we can take an adventure really far back in time, how fast can we play? Yeah, we need some sound effects. 
This is my try at making a reverse sound. back. <laughs> 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 um, so this painter in particular was um, George Catlin, and he's got a lot of these. Um, and he has, um, they've published his journal articles and his letters, and it talks a lot about this. And it talks about how um, he watched Native American communities be decimated. He watched settlers be decimated. He watched buffalo populations, I think that some of here, um, be overrun by prairie fires. Um, and doing some work on fire in Nebraska and the Great Plains, those are very similar to the Marshall Fire where it's all grasses. And so you can get a 60 mile an hour wind and you can burn like 100,000 acres in an afternoon. Um, those are some, I know my boyfriend tells a story where his dad was getting like overrun. He, his car couldn't go fast enough because the fire was moving faster than the vehicle at full speed. So when you deal with light flashy fuels, like grasses, they can move really, really fast. Compared to um, like timber or like a forest on fire, that moves much slower. Maybe five miles a day is like a crazy run. There you go. Wow. Right here. Yeah, uh, what can we do on a federal level to fight smoke not at the source? What can we do at a federal level not to fight smoke at the source? I wonder what my former supervisor would say, because he's literally <laughs> like the Washington, D.C. smoke manager. Not really. I mean, it's so when it comes to smoke, smoke is fire, essentially, right? The firefighters don't see smoke because they see smoke and think fire. We don't even really see smoke because we see smoke and we think fire. And so back in the day before European settlement, and this is literally like the um, regional haze rule uh, in the EPA Clean Air Act talks about this. They're trying to get our air back to a glide slope pre-European settlement. Now they don't include smoke in that because before European settlement, there was a lot more smoke because there was a lot more fire. It just wasn't mega fire, Cameron Peak, a month long type of smoke. So a little bit of smoke can mitigate your risk to a lot of smoke. So with prescribed fire, we try to put essentially a checkerboard pattern on the forest where we burn little checkers. So when lightning strikes, it only burns to the next checker that has been burnt, just like that Cameron Peak burn scar. So if we do that, it kind of creates a buffer to those huge mega fires. And since we haven't allowed fire on the landscape, you have places like if you go hiking by Netherland, right? And you look out, it's all the same kind of tree for as far as the eye can see. That's not what the forest used to look like before European settlement. We've all probably heard about that thing when the, the, there was a TED talk too, where like they introduced like two wolves and it changed the course of rivers. That's kind of what we're talking about. Excluding fire and putting out every fire before noon every single day has allowed the forest to become overgrown monocrop, which means if lightning strikes and that forest was supposed to burn every 20 years before European settlement, it hasn't burned in 150 years, that thing's going up and it's going scor scorched earth, lorax, there's not even seeds to reseed that forest. So that's what the wildfire crisis is, and that's why we have more mega fires because we haven't allowed fire. So if you're ever listening to an incident commander on a wildfire talk about, we're getting this thing out right now, we're staying here till it's cold, that's a little scary, because that's the rhetoric that allowed us to get in this current situation. Well, we'll do one more. This guy right here. So where can we as a general public apply pressure to get better policies implemented regarding these kinds of uh, controlled burns? How do we get better policies for controlled oh burns? Oh God, this is why I'm not telling you guys where I work right now. <laughs> my boyfriend can attest I was up till, I was working till 10 p.m. last night, like literally sending a press briefing on like how the state of Colorado could allow us to do more prescribed fire. So right now, I don't, ugh, like, this is rough, man, because I don't know, I think our dollar bills are more important than our votes, first of all. So I'm not gonna tell you to like vote in people that give a shit because it doesn't matter what they tell you, it matters how you spend your money. Um, so like, there's, that's the end of my TED talk on that. <laughs> but, um, Currently, there was like a memorandum of understanding that was signed by like the CDC, FEMA, EPA, USDA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, 
Department of Interior that all said we need to find ways within the Clean Air Act to allow prescribed fire. So that's been signed by the current administration, all those parties, but in my opinion, and I literally work directly on that, it gave us no teeth, right? I'm trying to get stuff done, and the regulators are like, well, based on the Clean Air Act and how we interpret it, like our hands are kind of tied. Um, so show up at the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission meeting and testify, because those are your rights. You know, when Suncor opens a new boiler, you can show up at the commission meeting and say how much that's going to impact you and how you don't want it. And I found out yesterday, you can just show up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Amber, so much. That was amazing. Um, continue the claps for yourselves. You've been amazing tonight. Oh, my God. Yeah.